entertainment mixed with football. It's what the new owners envision to fill the seats at Skydome. overlooked is the fact the Argonauts are a talent-laden football team, and tonight they'll get a test from some outstanding defenders. A bone-crunching tackle from James West is not soon forgotten. Few receivers can catch the ball against cornerback Rod Hill, and Greg Battle is a linebacker at the peak of his career. CFL quarterbacks like to run. Battle can hunt them down. There is no love loss between the Bombers and Argonauts, especially since Winnipeg narrowly beat Toronto to advance to last year's Grey Cup game en route to winning the Cup. Even in preseason, feelings between these teams ran high. The regular season battle lines have been drawn. There are even some Winnipeg fans in the crowd tonight. The stars of tonight's show are on the football field. It's football that has drawn fans to Skydome. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Skydome. The Blues Brothers are not here tonight, but two good football teams are. One of them, the Grey Cup champions, and the other owns the most explosive offense in the CFL. This was supposed to be the game to accurately test the Rocket and the rest of the Argonaut offense, but the Winnipeg defense has been beset with injuries. And to talk some more about that, let's go to the broadcast booth to hear from Joe Galat and Don Whitman. Thank you, Scott. Hi, everybody. Joe, there's no question that Winnipeg defense is hurting. As a matter of fact, almost half of the league's number one rated defense a year ago missing from tonight's ballgame. Well, that's true. They have uh, two good solid linebackers missing. They've got two good defensive backs missing. But let's not forget, there are eight tough football players that beat Toronto five times last year, and they're still here. I suppose it all depends on how you look at it, whether the glass is half full or half empty. Anyway, with all those people out of the Winnipeg defensive unit, I imagine the Argos often Offensively are licking their chops just a little with their multi-talented offensive weapons. Well, the Argos would like to get into what they call the six-pack. That's where they open up the offense, they empty out the backfield, put all of their receivers up on the line of scrimmage, and they hope to defray some of that blitzing and some of that pressure that Winnipeg can put on you defensively. So the six-pack may be the answer tonight. And if Ricky Foggy is not throwing the football, he is certainly capable of running the ball. And Joe, we heard from Coach Adam Rita yesterday, he expects the Rocket to handle the ball at least 10 times in the first half. That should be a lot of fun because 10 times, that means a lot of fireworks and a lot of action. All right, Scott. Well, Don, lots of business to take care of on Live at the Half tonight. Argo quarterback Matt Dunnigan will join me live here at Sky Dome, and we'll review the current issues in the CFL through three weeks of action. When we go coast to coast, they include a couple of red-hot quarterbacks and a Calgary financial crisis. That's on Live at the Half. The kickoff is coming up next. Confessions, fantasies, and private dreams. Now you can try them free, free, free. Women's Confessions. Learn the private secrets women hide. Dial 1-900-230-FREE. Try it free. Discover fantasies of romance and love. Dial 1-900-386-FREE. Try it free. Take a peek inside their private dreams. Dial 1-900-847-FREE and try it free. Try them now. Try them all for free. Confessions, fantasies, and private dreams. America's most revealing $15 confession lines with the first minute free. Adults only. In Japan, the hand can be used like a knife. But this method doesn't work with a tomato. 
Introducing the new patented Ginsu 2000. The high carbon steel blade can rip through ribs or destroy the most challenging chicken. Use this edge and it's a precision carving knife. The third cutting surface is non-stick. The Ginsu 2000 can saw a lead pipe and still slice a tomato like this. You also get six legendary Ginsu steak knives. But wait, there's more. We'll also give you this Ginsu paring knife for delicate cutting, plus this fruit and vegetable knife. You even get this Ginsu utility knife. Now, how much would you pay? Well, the knife of the 90s is priced like the 70s. You get the Ginsu 2000, all 10 superior quality knives backed by our famous 50-year guarantee for only $19.95. Get your legend now. Have your credit card ready and call toll-free 1-800-776-2800 or send $19.95 plus $4.95 shipping to Ginsu 2000, P.O. Box 7137-L, Buffalo Grove, Illinois. Welcome back to the Sky Dome. The roof tonight again is open, although there are some threatening clouds in the vicinity. The Toronto Argonauts attempting to take a stranglehold on first place in the Eastern Division. Daryl Rogers, the rookie head coach of the defending Grey Cup champion Winnipeg Blue Bombers, has some other ideas, although his ranks are certainly decimated by injuries. And Adam Rado hopes that his Toronto offense can continue to be as productive as they were a week ago against the Hamilton Ticats. And John Candy, one of the owners of the Toronto Argonauts, again busily engaged in signing autographs down at field level as he makes his way up to the press box location where he will observe the game. The opening kickoff is handled by Greg Battle, and Battle is brought down at the 38-yard line. That's where Winnipeg will scrimmage first and 10. Donovan Wright was there to make the tackle after an eight-yard return. Well, Burgess knows what he wants to do now. He's got good field position, 38-yard line. He wants some of his receivers to hold on to the football. That's not what happened last week. They dropped a lot of balls. If they can convert on second down, get some drives going, Burgess will be happy. Willis goes wide right. Troy Johnson, who made a CFL debut last week against BC, is the flanker to the left. Hand off to Mims, and Mims picks up about three yards. Daryl Ford was there to make the tackle. The Bombers had problems moving the ball last week against the BC Lions in an overtime loss, and Coach Daryl Rogers suggested it was lack of execution more than anything else that hurt the team. Dennis Meyer wants to hold them down to a short play on first down, which is what he got, but look out for Larry Willis on second down because Burgess likes to go to him. He's their big play man. Second down, Burgess completes the pass for a first down. Ken Whiney takes it out to the midfield strike. A gain of 13 for Ken Whiney as Carl Bla Brasley and Reggie Pleasant made the tackle. Well, that was good pass protection, and what they need to do is get Harold Hallman up the middle to bust up those things that happen on pass protection, and Chris Gaines as the middle linebacker has got to dictate no running game, as is Darrell Ford. First and 10, the ball just across the midfield stripe into Argo territory. The pitch to Robert Mims, the leading rusher last year in the CFL and the number one rusher so far this season. He gets inside the 50-yard line, stopped there by Rodney Harding. Pal Sartori, who is the assistant head coach, suggested that the Winnipeg Blue Bombers might be able to run against the Argos. Well, they did a good job on this play, and that's what they want to do is to get into second and four, uh, even second and five. Not too bad for the Winnipeg peg offense. Good first down play. Wide right goes Willis. Troy Johnson to the left. Second and five, Winnipeg. Burgess will throw. Looking over the middle, he dumps it off to Whiney. Whiney is going to be stopped short of a first down by Daryl Ford. But I think the Winnipeg Blue Bombers just a yard or maybe even less shy of that forward marker will gamble on third down. Looks like it'd be the, the obvious thing to do here. They're in pretty good field position. You have to give a yard on defense. I think they're going to go for it. Uh, good play by Daryl Ford. Uh, coming up, making a good solid tackle. That's what they have to do. Let him make a five-yard gain. Don't let him make that into a big play. Battle Pearson Randolph come in on this third and one, and Tom Burgess keeps as he goes over the middle for another Winnipeg first down. Well, some of the big guys are going out. Now they're putting the wide receivers back in, but you saw a little determination there by Burgess. He's saying, hey, I'm going to get this offense moving this week. I think he was frustrated last week, and he's shown that he wants to make it work this week. 
Winnipeg won all four regular season battles with the Argos a year ago. They also won that Eastern final on that last second field goal by Trevor Kennard. And they won a preseason game against Toronto this year. So they have a streak of six consecutive wins against the Argos going for them. Robert Mims cuts it back inside and his advance will be limited to a yard, maybe two. 11.57 remaining in this opening quarter. It's still scoreless here at the Sky Dome. As in any football game, it's the big guys up front that make it work. Good job up front of controlling people. When you see linemen get underneath the pads, that means they're playing good defense. Up front, it's Mike Campbell, Harold Hallman, and Rodney Harding. Brian Warren is a rush in, but he often will switch to a linebacking position. Burgess on second down. Dumping it over the middle, they were trying to set up the screen. Are they going to rule a complete pass from the And that appears to be the case, yes. Robert Mims was unable to hang on. Hallman stripped the ball from him. And Chris Munford, the safety, made the recovery. So with 11-21 remaining in the opening quarter, the Argos take over. Got the prices. The hottest prices in town are at Larry Miller Toyota, like a 1991 Camry for just $149 down or $149 a month, or a tough Toyota truck for $99 down or $99 a month. We're also big on service. With master technicians to keep your Toyota running its best. And our parts and service departments are open Monday through Friday until 8 p.m. Only at Larry Miller Toyota. Prices, parts, and service. Now that's what a dealer should be. Car problems? Did you know you could cut your car repair costs up to 50%? Well, you can. If you insist on clean, tested, guaranteed used parts bought from a member of the Arizona Automotive Recyclers Association. So the next time you have car problems, ask your mechanic about the used parts alternative. Tell him to look for this logo so he'll know who to call. Winnipeg defense has just taken the field without all-star cornerback Les Brown. Uh, he was ruled out this morning. That means that Eddie Taylor, a rookie, takes your place. What did you tell him about, about facing Jeff Boyd and Rocket Ismail before the game? Well, Eddie has a lot of speed. You know, uh, being a young kid, he's got all of his parts together. Uh, I just told him to basically stick with things and uh, trust his speed and not to play deep on these guys and give them too much respect. And if he needed any problems, I played against Jeff for eight years, so I told him if he needed any, any help just to come over and ask me anything, I'll be right here. I'm sure he'll be talking to you throughout the course of the game tonight. Les, thanks for your time and get well. All right, thanks. Don? I like that description, Joe. A young kid, he has all his parts together. I think that's good to have all your parts <laughs> together. I've seen, I've seen some football players that haven't had all their parts together. Ricky Foggy, the starting quarterback, he came on in relief of Matt Dunnigan early in the first quarter last week against Hamilton. He is throwing deep for the rocket over his head. The blitz was on, and more importantly, Ricky Foggy has to get back up off the ground, and I think that's what's going to tell about this ball game tonight. What are the big guys doing up front? Rocket showed his speed. He was wide open. Rod Hill said last night he told us, I can't believe how that guy comes off the line of scrimmage. He's running full speed in three steps. That's exactly what you saw there, Rod. They have a lot of offensive weapons. Clemens and Smith. Two of the people that quarterback Ricky Foggy can throw to, and with the addition of the Rockets and Andrew Murray, even more. This to Daryl K. Smith, penalty flag on the play. It appeared to be a pick. Now, they may be calling offensive interference. Well, that's what the Winnipeg defense is calling, offensive interference. But more importantly, we saw the bimbo package, which means they substituted the two tight ends. Forward pass interference. Toronto number 25. Decline. Third down. It was offensive pass interference as they ran that pick with Daryl Smith and the Rocket. What they're trying to do is to keep better protection in by putting some big guys in the lineup. And uh, Kardashian and Schmidt went in as tight ends. They're going to do a good job of blocking and hey! work the two-receiver combination. Unfortunately, the official had other ideas. I'll bet you Daryl Ro Rogers is happy with the officiating for so far. 
Lance Jomick is back for this third down punt. He has replaced Hank Elisic. Elisic was injured in last week's game. And the ball goes out of bounds at the 54-yard line. So the Blue Bombers take over with excellent field position. Only a 23-yard kick that time by Lance Chomick. The Argos have won both their regular season starts. They opened the season in Ottawa last week at home. They beat the Hamilton Ticats. Winnipeg 1-1, one one, their victory over Hamilton. They lost in overtime last week to the BC Lions. And the BC Lions are in action tonight against the Edmonton Eskimos, a team that's attempting to move into a first-place tie in the West with the Calgary Stampeders. Winners last night over the Ottawa Rough Riders. Burgess throwing over the middle, and is it intercepted? Yes. Don Moon dropped back into the coverage against slot back Rick House. And it took a moment for the official to signal the interception, but the veteran Toronto linebacker did pick it up. Don Moan uh, really played the pattern that time. He saw the uh, motion coming up with the fullback showing the direction. Warren Hudson sat to the line of scrimmage. He came right over and played the football. That's what a good linebacker has to do. He's got to be good in the air. He's got to be good on the land. He's got to be good in the sea of blockers on special teams, like a Marine, air, land, and sea. with Raheem Ishmael. This is what the fans want to see, the speed of the rocket, and he gets to the 50-yard line of Winnipeg. The ball comes loose, but the whistle apparently had already gone. Adam Rita said we would see the rocket at least 10 times in the first half. We'd see him carry the ball from the backfield. He said we would see him catch passes, and he has fulfilled his promise at this point. They're ruling that the ball did come loose prior to the whistle, and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers take over. So a turnover at the 50-yard line as that ball came free. The fans are reacting because they felt that the rocket had been stopped prior to that ball coming loose and that the whistle had gone. Mims the ball carrier across midfield into the 53-yard line of the Argos. This is going to be a tough ball game. You can see right now the momentum isn't going to be building on either side. It's going to be who gets in the most licks. Hard nose tackle on, on the rocket. And unfortunately, he didn't bring the ball with him when he got all the way to the ground. And I think it was an alert play on Winnipeg's part. the Toronto bench the Rocket discussing that most recent play and the fumble Robert Mims the ball carrier for Winnipeg trying to get the first down at the 50 yard line is stopped by middle linebacker Chris Gaines 825 remaining in this opening quarter this is what Winnipeg has to do they can control the line of scrimmage the big guys the big guys up front that wear those tight jerseys and sometimes have a little Vaseline on them they've got to do the job blocking there's but another big guy and he gets right into the action down at the Toronto bench. John Candy, one of the three owners of the Argonauts, along with Wayne Gretzky and Bruce McNall. All three are in attendance tonight here at the Sky Dome. Larry Willis on the sidelines, and Ed Berry bounces him out of bounds. That will be a gain of about eight yards. That's controlling the line of scrimmage. They're expecting to run. Larry Willis comes off. Good body lean plants and comes back. A lot of respect from Barry giving him that six, seven yard gain. Much traveled Larry Willis signing as a free agent this year with Winnipeg, initially coming into the CFL with Calgary, then going to British Columbia and Edmonton before contacting the Bombers this year and having a contract offered to him by General Manager Cal Murphy. Robert Mims looking for the first down and gets it inside the 40 yard line. With 7.24 remaining in the opening quarter, let's bring in on the sideline, Scotto. All right, Don, you mentioned him a moment ago. He's on the bench. He's ready to get suited up. He is John Candy. I know you're an Argo well, football not quite, fan. But... Not quite ready to get <laughs> suited up. I have, a, I have a bad knee, and I'm on the reserve list. <laughs> what about that metal plate in your head? 
it's still there and it's still buzzing in airports. How does it feel to have money on the line? It's a different thing to watch an Argo game when you haven't no, got no, money no, on the no, line. No, nothing on the line here other than uh, entertainment. And uh, we're, we're bringing it tonight here in, uh, at the Sky Dome here with the Toronto Argonauts and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. It's the greatest. Uh, look at all the fans out here. They're enjoying themselves. It's the best part of it. You must have been pleased, John, to have people talking about the Argos and the show at the Sky Dome last week as they were when it was all over. Well, they will uh, They will from back then and they will tonight, too, because we've got a great halftime show lined up tonight. But we've got a great the, the show is really on the field right now. And we've got uh, some of the greatest players in, uh, in Canada right out there. What would Yash Mengi say about the Argos? Well, he would say, you know, that they're very popular and they will win the Grey Cup and you don't have to... <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Okay, thanks, John. There you go. <laughs> Good night. Chris Munford with the interception. His fourth interception of the season. And the Toronto Argonauts take over once again. What a year Chris Munford is having as the Argos safety. Confessions, fantasies, and private dreams. Now you can try them free, free, free. Women's Confessions. Learn the private secrets women hide. Dial 1-900-230-FREE. Try it free. Discover fantasies of romance and love. Dial 1-900-386-FREE. Try it free. Take a peek inside their private dreams. Dial 1-900-847-FREE and try it free. Try them now. Try them all for free. Confessions, fantasies, and private dreams. America's most revealing $15 confession lines with the first minute free. Adults only. There are lots of ways to pick a dentist. Ask a friend, look in the phone book, but what does that really tell you about them? At 1-800-DENTIST, we refer from a select group of dentists, and we have a full profile on each of them. Their education, how many years in practice, what special training they have. And with our dentists, you have the security of knowing that we refer thousands of patients to them every month. So if you need a dentist and you want to make an educated choice, call 1-800-DENTIST today. So far, this has not been the tidiest game of the year. Four turnovers. The most recent, the fourth interception of the season for Chris Munford. And that total surpasses his career interception total. Well, Whiney stopped, and it made uh, Burgess look like he didn't know who he was throwing to. But uh, Whiney was supposed to be going down through the middle on zone coverage. And the free safety, the goalie, center fielder, pulled the ball in. Blitz coming from the back side, and they tried to dump it over the middle to Mike Clemens, and Alfred Payton was coming from his linebacking position. He's the rookie that they signed at a free agent camp, and he has moved into the lineup, replacing Albert Williams. They're crossing the linebackers and trying to confuse the offensive line's blocking, but they're really getting to them off the corner, knocking Ricky Foggy down on the ground. And remember, he has a sore shoulder. Second and 10. The Argos are at their own 38-yard line. Again, pressure from Peyton. Foggy escapes. They'll try and run for a first down. He won't get it. Greg Battle. The outstanding defensive player in the CFL a year ago came over to make the tackle, and that forces the Argos into a punting situation. Well, Ricky Foggy uh, was told by Adam Reeder to run like a scalded dog when you get the pressure, and uh, he certainly had pressure that time, but the great recovery ability of the Blue Bombers was obvious, and uh, they, had, they played it really well, had the outside pressure, and they had a man coming from the inside. Ricky had no place to go but down. Troy Johnson and Ken Whiney are back for this third down punt by Lance Chomick. And again, not a particularly good kick. Pressure coming from Paul Randolph. Ken Whiney on this punt return. And he's forced out of bounds up at the 47. The Winnipeg Blue Bombers again will have good field position after a 12-yard return by Ken Whiney. Well, that's the second bad kick, and uh, they're giving uh, Chomick so much pressure up the middle that he's shanking the ball. It's a tough situation because Chomick normally isn't the punter. Winnipeg's taking full advantage of that by rushing the punter with 10 people. 
Well, they had over 41,000 in attendance for the Argos' home debut at the Sky Dome. They anticipated that they would be somewhere close to 40,000 for this second game of the season against the defending Grey Cup champion Winnipeg Blue Bombers. Robert Mims, the ball carrier, he runs out of the grasp of Gaines and fights his way to the midfield stripe. And it was Mike Campbell who came over to finally bring him down. This isn't very fancy. It's just big guy on big guy. And uh, Chris Gaines came over to make the tackle, but he really got blocked. He got hit instead of him making the hit. Gaines makes the nice cut, drops the shoulder, and really delivers the blow and comes out the other end, and that's the mark of a great back. On second down, Robert Mims again. He should have the first down as he fights his way to the Toronto 52-yard line. They're having a street fight up front. I think it's uh, very interesting to see. It's not a lot of fancy cross-blocking or anything. They're going right at Hallman. They're going right at Harding. They're blocking those backers, and they're just nose on nose. And it looks like a tough, tough football game coming up. It's going to be a long day if Toronto doesn't stop the run first. First and 10, Winnipeg. The ball is up to 52 of the Argos. Burgess completes the pass for a first down to Rick House as he gets inside the 40-yard line. is Winnipeg's leading receiver this year. Ten receptions coming into the game. Back in 1981, Rick House was one of 14 1,000-yard receivers in the CFL. He's the only one of those 14 still playing football. Reminds me of that song, This Old House. <laughs> Pretty effective, though. 13 seasons in the Canadian Football League. One of the many graduates of Simon Fraser University. Larry Willis was the intended receiver. He was overthrown, and he was being covered by F. Berry. It will be second and 10. Winnipeg, the ball is at the 39, between the 38 and the 39-yard lines. There was a penalty flag on the play. First down. Dropping the pass or the call against the Argos. Burgess was hit after he delivered the football. Well, that's way late, and if they want to hit him, they got to get to him faster. Uh, he called it on Harding, and uh, I know the frustration. He's playing run, and then when he gets a chance to rush the passer, he's in trouble. First down play. Rick House the target. Can't catch up with it. Don Wilson was defending against it. This is the matchup that Winnipeg was trying to get. Rick House on Don Wilson. Well, you know, they say you got to have a catchable pass in order to get the interference call. There's a lot of bumping going on, and Rick House knew what he wanted. He sold him on the inside position. The Wilson screened him off to the outside, and there wasn't any place to put the football for Burgess. It's second and 10, Winnipeg. The ball is at the 24. 226 remaining in the opening quarter. Burgess to the sidelines, and this is a first down with Larry Willis taking out a bound. protesting that he had his feet inbounds, but they rule that he was up. Larry Willis is saying, man, you're right on top of the play. Why can't you see where my feet are? He only needs to have one foot inbounds, and I'll tell you, Daryl Rogers isn't happy with the officiating last week. He won't be happy with that one. It appeared as though he came down with both feet inbounds, not just one, but both, and Willis, with the benefit of that replay, has reason to be upset. So does Daryl Rogers. I mean, he's saying, what do I got to do to get a break here? Last week we had the fumble. This week we had the sideline problem. 31-yard field goal attempt by Trevor Kennard. It is good. So the Winnipeg Blue Bombers are first on the board here at the Sky Dome. A Trevor Kennard 31-yard field goal with 2.02 remaining in the opening quarter. 
Larry Willis continued his argument with referee Jake Ireland that he was in bounds on that pass reception and the benefit of the end zone replay clearly shows that not only did he come down with one foot in bounds he had both feet in bounds Darrell Rogers a little upset with that call as was Larry Willis Rogers was upset in overtime last week against the BC Lions when it was ruled that Troy Johnson on a punt return fumbled and the replay seemed to indicate that it was the ground that caused him to fumble the only possible explanation of that would be that the official thought he bobbled the ball, but it looked like a very clear reception by Willis with the feet in bounds. He wasn't bobbling the ball at all. So with his mail and Clemens set to return, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers following the Kennard field goal kickoff. Ismail takes it at the five. He brings it out to the 27-yard line, and that's where the Argos will scrimmage first and 10. A 19-yard return by the Rocket. Michael Allen was there to make the tackle. Well, that's about the third time the Rockets had the ball, and uh, so far he's, he's been having some trouble holding on to it, but uh, he needs to get something going. I think he's probably over the pregame jitters. This is just the reverse of uh, what took place last week in the Argos' home debut when they totally dominated the first quarter against the Hamilton Ticats in terms of time of possession. Winnipeg has had the football for most of this opening quarter, but three turnovers have cost the Blue Bombers. Here comes the blitz. There's the pitch to Clemens. Defending Grey Cup champion Winnipeg Blue Bombers leading by a score of 3-0, but on the opening play of the second quarter, Lance Chomick will attempt to tie it with a 21-yard field goal. It's good. Well, I think Adam Rita has to be a little concerned that his offense isn't clicking the way he had hoped in this game against Winnipeg. Adam wanted to get the ball to the rocket. He wanted to use those two tight ends to give Ricky Foggy a little added protection, but Foggy's been on the ground, and when you can knock the quarterback down, particularly when he has a bad shoulder, I got to think that Ricky took a little bit off of that ball when he threw it all the way across the field. I don't think he's 100%. Statistically, in the opening quarter, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, in terms of possession, had the football for 10 minutes and 12 seconds, but those three turnovers proved costly. Most of the Toronto yardage came on that one big effort by Mike Pinball Clemens, a 63-yard run, and that's the reason they have the edge in terms of net yards. Rookie head coach Daryl Rogers of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers Carroll's got to be happy because he had three turnovers and they're still tied in a ball game, and that's uh, a, a good sign that they're playing good defense. Ken Whiney will start from his own eight-yard line on this kickoff return. He tried to get to the outside, and he was brought down there by Dave Van Delingham, a 10-yard run back. Very difficult to get a ball to the wide side of the field like that. Burgess, I'm sure, isn't very happy to have to start on his own 19-yard line. It appears as though Ken Whiney is the injured player, and he appears to be in a great deal of pain. Those special teams are really tough. Uh, it's just a sea of blockers out there. That field is 65 yards wide. You're trying to make a make something out of nothing, and Whiney has a wall, but he's got some extra people out in front, and he doesn't have anybody escorting him. No blockers out there for him, and he takes a solid hit. And, you know, I think the mothers, the wives, and the girlfriends of special teams players, you know, they watch the games, but they watch them in the closet from a crack in the door. It appeared as though his knee buckled underneath him as he attempted to make that cut. Well, it's like playing on uh, asphalt with a carpet. Very tough cut. He's trying to go at right angles, and you can just see too much weight on the front leg, and something had to give. When you're on Nasco turf, those cleats bite in, and it's usually the knee that gives. Very difficult to make those kinds of cuts on Nasco turf. I hope he's doing okay. We'd like to see him get up and walk off. 
Trainer Ross Hodgkinson examining the injured Ken Whiney. Rob Crefo will come in to take his spot at slot back for Winnipeg. He provides a much bigger target, of course, but does not have the speed. He's 6'6", 215 pounds. Well, Daryl Rogers, he would like to have Whiney in there. Whiney's got great speed, and uh, he'd like to have him in there at that inside position because he had him open on two occasions in the first quarter. Last year, Winnipeg won that playoff game on a last-second field goal by Trevor Kennard. July 20th, Winnipeg won 34-17. August 22nd, 27-23. August the 5th, 25-9. And October 13th, 21-16. So despite the fact that the Argos last year had the most potent offense in the history of the Canadian Football League, setting a record, 689 points, they only average 16 points per game against Winnipeg. Winnipeg has that swarming defense. It's, they got a tremendous amount of pursuit out of their defensive people, and uh, Pinball Clements normally would have had a touchdown against anybody else, but they rolled well. They came back to the, to the other side of the field and had a great play out of Eddie Taylor to prevent the touchdown. So when you play Winnipeg, you have to earn every yard that you get offensively, and it's just quite a contrast with the Toronto six-pack, the Toronto bimbo package. They're going against one of the better defenses in football. Well, they talk about the pride and the glory as the slogan of the Toronto Argonauts this year. Many of the players suggest they could also add fun to that uh, slogan for this 1991 season, and we saw some evidence of it yesterday. The final practice here at the Sky Dome, and watch the athletic ability of the Rockets. I think he's about a 7.9 on that free floor exercise. If he ever gets in the end zone, do you think we'll see one of those back flips? I hope so. I'd like to see the back flip, the front flip, and uh, even a spike, maybe. The interesting thing, Adam Rita was telling us that Keith Kelly is also very proficient at uh, doing those flips as we see Ken Whiney being taken off to the Winnipeg dressing room. First and 10, Winnipeg. The Bombers at their own 19-yard line. Burgess over the middle to Crefo. It's a first down at the 40-yard line. Chris Munford, the safety, came up to make the tackle. And as Whiney heads off to that Winnipeg dressing room, he appears to be in a great deal of pain. Well, there's such a sharp pain when you do anything with those knee ligaments. And the human knee isn't built for football. Good job here by Burgess. It's a throwback, and he catches the zone coverage moving to the strong side. First and 10, Winnipeg. Draw play. Robert Mims fights his way out to the 47. Pickup of six yards. Don Moan, the linebacker, came over to make the tackle. One of the problems that Toronto's having is that their linebackers are having to make the tackles. The defensive linemen are getting turned, and that puts an awful lot of pressure on Moan and Gaines and Ford. Coming into the game, Robert Mims, the leading rusher this year in the CFL, 210 yards. He's added to that total with a fairly hefty workload through the first quarter so far tonight. Burgess complete to Willis for a first down, and this time there's no question he was in bounds as Don Wilson came over to make the tackle. Larry Willis protecting that football as he's taken down by Don Wilson with a first down at the 46-yard line. No question about this man's ability to catch the football. He's had some uh, off-the-field problems with his previous employers in the CFL. Over the middle to Warren Hudson. Hudson looking for some blocking help. He gets a first down inside the 35. Darrell Rogers said that he needed to have a good game out of Hudson. He uh, felt like he just got an average game out of him last week. This week, you see Hudson doing a much better job of blocking. Here he catches the screen pass, much like the six-pack package that Toronto uses. They had everybody spread out, and Hudson came in with a nice game. Good blocking up front, good hit by Don Moan to bring him down. Rogers was saying that Hudson so far this year has not played like the performer who won most 
outstanding Canadian honors in the Grey Cup a year ago. Flag on the play as Robert Mims takes the toss and gets inside the 30-yard line. It's offside Toronto. Chris Munford, the safety, was coming up on a blitz, and it appeared as though his timing was a little off as he hit the line of scrimmage. There you see it. Uh, Tommy Burgess adds to a team, and we talked to Daryl Rogers yesterday about which quarterback he was going to use, Danny McManus, or if he was going to use Tom Burgess. Tom Burgess saw the blitz coming. He saw the safety blitz coming in. He delayed the count to get the offsides, and that's good, alert, smart football. Streeter into the ball game. Troy Johnson out for Winnipeg as they make a change at one wide receiver position. The handoff to... Hudson down to the 20-yard line, and that's another Winnipeg first down. Scott? Well, Don, the season may well feel like one big injury to some of the Bomber players. Now uh, you can add Ken Whiney to the list. On the play that he went down, they suspect he's torn a major tendon in his left knee at the same time, sprained his ankle, and uh, the considered but uh, early opinion of the Bomber team doctor here is that he may be looking at surgery before he can return to the Bomber lineup. It's been a rough year as far as injuries go with the Winnipeg Football Club. From the 20, first and 10. This is intercepted by Don Wilson. It deflected away from Rick House. Larry Willis brings down Wilson, but not before he returned it to the Winnipeg 27. The fourth turnover of the football game puts the Argos in position with 10.51 left in the half. Well, turnovers have really hurt the Blue Bombers tonight. Don Wilson's interception return for 72 yards, the fourth turnover of the game. Puts the ball at the Winnipeg 27-yard line, first and 10. Either side has been able to put it in the end zone so far. Field goals, Trevor Kennard and Lance Chomick have a tie to three. Ricky Foggy, the ball carrier, gets away as a first down. Ricky Foggy called that play from the line of scrimmage. He had his two tight ends, which is... And he did a great job of running the sweep. This was the interception. They had Rick House matched up against Don Wilson. Burgess appeared to throw it behind the slot back. He did, and you can't throw that pass behind the receiver because he's got no chance to stop, turn around, and even defend against the interception. So Wilson had a lot of pay dirt ahead of him. Don Moan putting the pressure on quarterback Tom Burgess, dropping him just as he threw. It's first and ten. Hand off to Clinton. Stopped at the one. This is a football game. What a terrific hit. And a sandwich. That's a running back sandwich. Allen came over, made a super hit. It's, it's a counter draw play. It's touchdown all the way. Except that Allen had a different idea of it. From the one, the Argos managed to put it into the end zone. for the first time. Well, Ricky did a good job here because he pulled out on that uh, the audible that he made. Ricky Foggy saw that he had the run, and he called the line off the linebacker blitz, two tight ends. He rolled out to his right and set up that touchdown, so it's only fair that he should take it in for the, for the score. Point after by Lance Chomick, and the Argos now move in front by a score of 10-3 with 9-10 remaining in the half. And we'll be back with the Toronto kickoff after this. The Don Wilson interception set up the touchdown. Three plays, and the Argos put it in the end zone with Ricky Foggy diving over. There was an offside call on the convert by Lance Chomick. As a result, the Argos kickoff from the 40 rather than the 35. 
Toronto 10, Winnipeg 3 with 9-10 remaining in the first half. Eric Streeter on the kickoff return out to the 31-yard line. He has replaced Ken Whiney, the injured ball player, on that kickoff return unit, a run back of 21 yards. Scott? Don, on Live at the Half tonight, we'll gauge reaction to the show put on at uh, Sky Dome by the Argonauts last week. They were talking about it for days in Toronto. Argonaut quarterback Matt Dunnigan will join us live, and we'll update you on some of the stories that have developed early in the season when we go coast to coast in the CFL. Also, Don and Joe will have a first-half highlight, and that's all on Live at the Half tonight. Harold Rogers has been moving the football, and his team has had the ball, but they haven't gotten the points, and that's what he's looking for right now. First and 10, the ball is at the 31. Burgess is forced out of there. Rodney Harding was the man initially in, pressuring the Winnipeg quarterback, who runs for a first down. That's a good play by Burgess. He didn't see anything downfield. He was getting some pressure. He tucked the ball, came back, and made a first down out of it. And that's what a quarterback does in the CFL. It's a leader, and Burgess is a leader. From the 43, Johnson goes wide left. Willis comes out to the right. First and 10, Winnipeg. 8-13 remaining in the half. Hand off to Robert Mims. Mims cuts back inside, and Mike Campbell is there to make the tackle. that if there, if there isn't one guy in front of that running back Mims that he's going to go somewhere and it was a good thing that Campbell came over because everybody else was fronted up and stalemated. Harold Hallman also assisted in that stop. Second and six Winnipeg. The ball at the 42. Yargo's leading by a score of 10-3. Treefel was the target. Burgess under throw. Winnipeg will be forced to kick it away. Darrell Ford, the linebacker, was pressuring quarterback Tom Burgess. Did he ever? He got a good job of uh, coming across and really getting into Burgess' vision. You know, a quarterback, if he can't see, he's not going to be very effective, and that's exactly what happened. Ford comes across, and he really... You see Burgess has to look up over his helmet and his vision is blocked and it's not going to be a good play for the offense. Clemens is the lone man back for Bob Cameron's first punt of the football game. Good downfield coverage by the Blue Bombers. James, first man downfield to make contact with the pinball. The 7-12 left in the first half. Yardich on kickoff and punt returns this year in the CFL. He will get this, the CBC Return to Sender Award in the form of this trophy. Don't worry, we're going to fix this with a bit of glue, but we spent big time on this, $32.10, GST included. He'll also get this, a collector's item from our 1976 Olympic uniform, the CBC pizza shirt. Uh, I guess the best thing you can say about it is that it's so far out that it's in. And the leader as we speak is the gizmo. And Don, I would think that uh, the knowledge that uh, these quality awards await him at the end of the season would be enough for the gizmo to maintain his lead the season long to get the CBC return to sender award. Might drop a few if you insist on giving him that shirt. I don't know about you, Don, but uh, I'd rather have the pizza. <laughs> smooth when he runs down the field and he's traveling a lot faster than you think. First and 10, the ball is at the 47 of the Blue Bombers. Paul Randolph, the linebacker, blitzing on the play and he gets him for a sack back at the 54. 
think Foggy's frustrated because he wasn't down. Uh, he touched his hand down, felt that his knee wasn't down, and uh, then they started to push him around. But uh, we're still looking for the uh, shorts of the cornerback over here, Eddie Taylor. Somewhere along about the 30-yard line, the Rocket lay, had him drop everything and beat him down the field. Foggy's knee touched the ground with blitzing linebacker Paul Randolph coming through. They rule that he touched down at the midfield strike. What an athlete to touch your knee and come back up like he did. Second and 18 from the shotgun. Here comes Randolph again. There's the throw over the middle. They were looking for Daryl Smith, and it's incomplete. When you throw into that zone coverage uh, of Winnipeg, they pull up a little bit because it's like putting your putting yourself, your body into the teeth of a buzzsaw. And you can watch all of these people converge on the football. It's tough to catch in all of that traffic. With a lot of elbows sticking up, too. That, that makes it a little more interesting. Remember, the Blue Bombers are missing five regulars. Daryl Sampson, Dave Bavell, Tyrone Jones, Les Brown, Albert Williams. The ball bounces back to the line of scrimmage, picked up alertly by Johnson, and he had three yardos trapped within that five-yard area. Well, they have to know that when the ball is in that bouncing position to get away from it. Now, I know it's frustrating to run 50 yards down the field and then get away from the football, but that's the rule. They have to let him catch the ball. It's it's a tough thing. Shot on number 79. First down. Once their momentum gets them down there, Nate Burkowski, he didn't want to stop. He wanted to hit somebody. Well, they're trying to get the ball to that man. One pass in his direction tonight for 41 yards. In his debut last week, he had 213 yards. 88 on punt return, 87 on kickoff returns, and 38 yards on one pass reception. 41 yards so far tonight on that pass reception. First and 10, Winnipeg. The ball is at the 33-yard line. Burgess. Dumping it off over the middle to Robert Mims, and he'll get a first down up to the 50-yard line. The Bombers have been moving the football, but they've been self-destructing with four turnovers. Well, it's just like golf. You know, you can drive for show, but you have to putt for the dough, and they get down there, and they don't putt it. They don't get the, the scores, and that's what they have to do to get things moving here. Mims takes advantage of the zone coverage. That's good football. Dump the ball off. Get the yardage you can. First and ten from the 50-yard line. And off the men from this time, he is caught by Don Moan from his linebacking position. He came through almost untouched and had a clean shot at Robert Mims. He made the tackle almost the moment that Mims took the handoff. That was a counter play. Don read it. Uh really well and they couldn't get anybody around the pulling guard and the pulling tackle actually if mims had been able to get inside of that block he might have had something a loss of seven at second and 17 winnipeg burgess forced to step up the throw to the sideline to streeter out of bounds and that should be a winnipeg first down at the 48 of the argos Eric Streeter was a fine college athlete. He was a quarterback and uh, played for the BC Lions. And he's a G-man. And uh, Streeter made a great cut, made a great cut to the outside. But Burgess was ruffled. Watch him, watch his arm get pulled here. He still breaks away. He said, get out of the way. I'm going to throw this thing for a first down. We want to get a touchdown. Delivers it on target to Streeter. Streeter does a little skip, and there it is. An 18-yard gain, first and 10 Winnipeg from the 49 of the Argos. Drops the football. He was getting set to cock his arm to throw. And inexplicably, the ball just dropped to the ground. Well, it hit him in the pocketbook, it looks like. He had it down along the side. He's got the ball down to the side, and he looks like he wants to really bring it back up to do something, and it hits his leg, apparently, right at the pocketbook. And now he has to recover the ball. A loss on the play, taking the ball back to the 53-yard line. It will be second and 18 Winnipeg when we return to the Sky Dome with the Argos leading by seven. Further 
another indication of how things have changed at the Sky Dome. This is the first time in the three seasons that the Argos have been tenants here that their logo is visible at center field. It stands for Argonauts, not Argos. Pass complete to Rick House. Big first down. That's two key second down conversions for Tom Burgess. He hit Eric Streeter on second and 17. He hits Rick House on second and 18, taking the ball to the 31. That's a big, big play by Rick House. He rolls out to find the time. House keeps working across the formation. That is a big play in this ball game because he took them out of the hole, and now they're down in scoring territory. Winnipeg with a statistical edge in first downs. But again, those four turnovers have really hurt them. Burgess trying to cut inside Darrell Ford, but the linebacker would have none of it. And stops him after a run of about three. Now Burgess wanted it. He wanted the home run. He wanted to go down deep and... Uh, Unfortunately, there wasn't anybody open, so what he picked up the uh, coverage deep downfield, and he didn't have time to react to anything else. He gets a good block, a good peel back here by Mims, or he would have been sacked. Mims picked up Ryan Warren. Second down, and this time nobody picked up Ryan Warren. Celebrating his 29th birthday today and also celebrating a quarterback sack. One of the tip-offs, of course, is Brian Warren off the line of scrimmage, and he knows he's on the blitz when he's off the line of scrimmage, coming in and takes the shoestring tackle for the sack. Mims unable to pick up Brian Warren. Trevor Kennard will attempt a 41-yard field goal. It's wide. And in the end zone, Carl Brazley concedes a single point. Trevor Kennard had an opportunity last week against the BC Lions to kick a 27-yard field goal on the final play of regulation time for victory. But there was a bad snap. The ball not really pinned that well. The kick went wide. It was kicked out of the end zone, and BC won it in overtime on a late field goal by Lou Pisaglia for a 26-23 win. 32 remaining in the half. 10 for the score. The Argos leading Winnipeg. Here's Warren after he made the sack because he knew that put them in a, in a deep position where they're not going to get the field goal unless they get a great kick. So Warren was celebrating prematurely but effectively. First and 10 Toronto. They decide to scrimmage from the 35 or they don't decide. They have to scrimmage from the 35 yard line on the missed field goal by Trevor Kennard. Keith Kelly stopped at the 39-yard line. Quincy Williams came over to make the tackle. Kelly has replaced Kevin Smelly as the Argos blocking back, but he probably is a blocking back, and this is an unusual formation. Here's the reverse with the rocket. Well, they tried something radical but the Winnipeg defenders were ready for it. That's called the lonesome polecat and what they did was put all of their blockers as well as Ricky Foggy to the wide side of the field and then they reversed back with only two blockers for the rocket and it worked uh, about as well as it looks. <laughs> A little confusing. Direct snap to Mike Clemens the only individual lined up behind center Skimp and uh, there's the reverse with the rocket, but Winnipeg defended against it. Well, they kept people on people and it was effective. Ball bouncing back to the line of scrimmage, picked up there by Johnson. And again, he has several Argos inside that five yard area with just 50 seconds remaining in this first half. Johnson saved an onside return because Chomick was coming in to recover the fumble. No yards, guys. No yards. Now, if it's Chomick who was inside that five-yard area, then, of course, there is no penalty on 
on the play. The officiating staff conferring, trying to determine exactly who was inside that restraining area. 50 seconds remaining, 10-4. Toronto leading Winnipeg. No yards. Toronto, the five-yard penalty. First down. Five-yard penalty. Takes the ball to the 52-yard line. Another good crowd in attendance at the Sky Dome. They had advanced sales of about 35,000 and were anticipating a walk-up crowd that could take attendance over 40,000 tonight. is that out of the 10 plays, you're going to get one tip, one interception. That's the one interception out of zone coverage that you're going to get. And Brazley was looking at the quarterback, reading his eyes all of the way, made a clean break in front of the receiver, and nobody was going to catch Dr. Death, as he was known back in the days of the Montreal Alouettes. Now Brazley takes it 56 yards into the end zone as the Argos their to their lead with uh, 40 seconds remaining Rodney Harding an injured Toronto player as Carl Brazley is congratulated at the bench Carl is what the CFL is all about he's been playing 11 years in the league he knows what has to be done out there he may not be the fastest football player on the football field but he is one of those smart players with great reactionary speed and he anticipated a short pass made the break on the football the theory is that you can travel one-third the distance that the ball travels when it leaves the quarterback's hands that's about exactly what it was one-third the distance Brazley had the clean break and now everybody's giving him a hug and a kiss and he is their man 16-4 with 40 seconds remaining, and Lance Chomick will attempt the extra point. Boy, oh boy, have those turnovers hurt the Winnipeg Blue Bombers tonight. They have moved the ball well. Interceptions and fumbles have resulted in Toronto points. They are blocking well. They're tackling well. They've had the turnovers, and the turnovers are worse than anything, penalties or whatever, because that turns the field position completely around. You can't afford to give four turnovers, four interceptions in one half. Don Moan, Chris with... Munford, Don Wilson, and Carl Brazley have all picked off Tom Burgess passes. Turned at 56 yards for the major score. Wilson's interception return set up a touchdown by Ricky Foggy. Brazley's given the sign. He's got four fingers up. That means there's four interceptions from the secondary and linebacking core. Johnson and Streeter are back for this kickoff, and it will be handled by Johnson. Flags on the play as Johnson is forced out of bounds at the 42-yard line. Bruce Elliott came across to force Johnson out as they attempted to set up the wall down the right-hand side. A 24-yard run back, but there was a penalty call on the play. How many times have we heard Bruce Elliott's Holding. name? Winnipeg number 44. First down. 
Well, Bruce Elliott's forte is special teams play. Leon Haciano guilty of the holding call. And as a result, that 24-yard run back goes for not. The ball brought back to the Winnipeg 26-yard line. The Blue Bombers coming into the ball game were concerned about their defense as a result of all the injuries. The defense has played pretty well. The offense has turned it over five times. That's been the problem, but the offense is not out of the ball game. They're blocking well. David Black up front with Laubauer and uh, Bob Moley. Inside, they've opened up some cutback lanes for Mims, and uh, it looks like David's just trying to get a little bit of a blow here, shake out the legs. Big guys never get hurt. You ever notice that? The big guys, they get bumped up a little bit, get a bruise, they just rub it a little, and they're not ever hurt. They're always back in the ball game. He'll be back in about three plays. Nick Benjamin and Bob Molly now at those guard positions with David Black going out of the ball game. A year ago, he didn't play too much. He was a little unhappy with his situation. But he's back in as a first stringer this year for the Blue Bombers. First and 10, Burgess over the middle to Warren Hudson. Hudson loses the football, picked up by the Bombers. Robert Mims was there to grab that uh, loose football after it bounced away from Warren Hudson. And it's a first down Winnipeg with 21 seconds remaining in the half. Chris Gaines was the man who stripped the ball from Warren Hudson. You know, that's the thing about Mims. He's an opportunistic ball player. He'll come back and make a block when you need it. He'll recover a fumble when you need it. Rick House takes the pass over the middle and is hit by Chris Gaines at the 50-yard line. learning from the coach. What do you want me to do, coach? We're getting into blitzes, but they got two tight ends. Over the middle of the house again. First down, Winnipeg at the 53 with just two seconds remaining in the half. Toronto defense has been on the field a long time. Harold Holman is starting to show some wear. You know, when you're a nose tackle, you get hit from all sides. Both guards are able to clip you. Center's able to block. That's tough. This will be the final play of the half, barring penalty. Burgess looking over the middle for Rick House. It's incomplete. Rick House just keeps on running to the Winnipeg dressing room as that is the final play of the first half here at the Sky Dome with the Argos enjoying a 13-point lead. Toronto 17, Winnipeg 4, and welcome to Live at the Half. Looks to be another good crowd at Skydome tonight. They were hoping for one in the area of 40,000. Many of them sold on the merit of attending an Argonaut game last week. One week ago tonight, the atmosphere in this building was electric. The Rocket debuted on the field, and off the field, the entertainment was first class. The show at the Skydome was the talk of Toronto. It's been many years since this sort of excitement prevailed at an Argonaut home game. The Blues Brothers set the stage at halftime, and not to forget, the Argonauts won their home opener. They were still talking about the show this week as we found out when we went to the streets of Toronto. It was great. It was uh, the Argos finally smartened up in addition to the rocket. They put some marketing into it. They made it a family evening. They uh, had lots of entertainment and fun, and it kept going before and afterwards. Bruce McNall and the boys did a really good job uh, promoting the game, and the Rockets definitely bringing uh, a lot of enthusiasm back to the Canadian Football League. I thought it was great. I thought it was a lot more exciting than it was uh, last year, and that probably has a lot to do with the hoopla and having, uh, you know, um, candy and the boys there. But I thought it was great. I think the sport deserves to take off, at least uh, as of last Thursday. There's a new excitement. I hope it sustains itself. Such a party atmosphere it was at Skydome last Thursday that this reporter had an out-of-body experience and mistakenly identified Dan Aykroyd's Elwood Blues character as Elwood Glover. No disrespect to the late and distinguished Elwood Glover intended. A 
And now on live at the half, we're joined at Sky Dome by Argo quarterback Elwood Dunnigan. Uh, that's a joke, Matt. Play along if you would. And tell me, tell me about the excitement in this building last week. What did you think of the atmosphere? Oh, it's fantastic. It was uh, something like the uh, the fans here have been yearning for something like that, and uh, just kind of exploded and kicked off the season for us. Pretty tough for you to have to sit on the bench and watch it. I know that you wanted to be in, but we're out because of that full calf muscle. I guess you're here to say that uh, you've had just about enough injuries uh, to last a career. That's right. I'm staying away from any tall bridges or tall buildings because they're very tense at this point. But uh, uh, the team continued on, did a heck of a job for us, and we got the victory in a party atmosphere. You're too finely tuned, I think, Matt. Uh, too subject to yanks and pulls. I don't know what the problem is, Scott. You know, I've asked everybody, seen everybody, and uh, it's just an unfortunate situation, one that I'm going to work through and uh, one that the Argos are going to get through, obviously with, with people like Ricky Foggy and Willie Gillis there. What of this game? It was close until Carl Brazley's interception returned for a touchdown. Those were 10 top points the Argo offense put on the board. Uh, the Winnipeg defense was not bending as many thought it would. Well, I, I didn't think they would. Uh, they're a very tough defensive football team. They proved that last year and over the years and uh, continually this year as well. The least amount of points scored against and uh, we're just trying to erase the uh, situation that happened to us last year. Why is there such bad feeling between these teams? Uh, from what does it stem? Uh, it's just a great rivalry. Uh, we're two very high powered, I think, football teams with a lot of pride and uh, there's a situation where uh, you know, it's just animosity builds up and you play each other so often, it's just a situation where uh, there's a lot of bad blood there. All right, Matt. A tough time to not be playing in this city. Get well soon. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Scott. Appreciate Stay it. with us when we come back on Live at the Half. We'll review what else is current around the CFL. Welcome back to Live at the Half. Three weeks of the CFL schedule are more than enough for stories to develop, and here are some that are current around the Canadian Football League. This edition of Coast to Coast begins out west where the BC Lions face the Edmonton Eskimos tonight and the Lions own the league's top-rated quarterback early in the season. Doug Flutie's been making things happen through the air and on the run in his second CFL season. We turned it around at the end of the season, won some ball games, felt good about ourselves. And my attitude and approach coming in was more, just I was in a more relaxed atmosphere coming into camp. Uh, I knew I was the number one guy. We could work on some things through camp. And also the fact that you were here for a full training camp helps. Ron Lancaster's Eskimos are 2-0 and and maybe a bit lucky. I, I guess if, if I had to think about it, I'd say we've probably been a little lucky, but I really don't care. You know, uh, every game is a new experience, and uh, whatever is going to happen in a game is going to happen. You try to adjust to the situation and make the best of it and go from there. But if you win, who cares? In Ottawa last night, Alan Pitts and the Calgary Stampeders were rolling. Pitts caught three touchdown passes. The Stampeders looked awesome as they shredded Ottawa's defense, striking early and often en route to a 14-point victory, their third win against no defeats. The loss cost the Rough Riders Bart Hall. The promising fullback tore up his knee early in the second quarter. He was to have surgery this morning and will miss the rest of the season. It's not how he expected to begin his pro career. God, you know, I, everything felt so positive when I came here. Uh, you know, the people here in Ottawa, you know, they welcomed me with open arms. And the veterans on all my teammates, they've just been, uh, just been great, you know. And uh, uh, it's, it's a little disheartening, but, you know, uh, I got you know, to gotta, gotta look at it as a learning experience and, uh, you know, just work hard in rehab. Ottawa fans are getting restless. There is speculation Steve Goldman could be called to answer for an 0-3 start. Hey, you know, that's just part of the job, and the fans are going to, when you're 0-3, the fans are going to be on your back. I expect them to be, I want them to want us to win. At the other end of the spectrum are the Stampeders and Danny Barrett, who threw four touchdown passes last night. We wanted to get a little bit more mixture with the offense, so we had to get our running game intact. And I think the guys up front did a great job blocking for the running game. They were challenged this week by the head coach, and I think they responded quite well in that area. The Calgary Stampeders are perfect on the field, but off the field, their financial situation could not be worse. They're $5.4 million in debt, and with interest payments of $40,000 a month, the Stamps can't keep pace. CFL Commissioner Donald Trump has convened a meeting of his governors for tomorrow morning here in Toronto. They'll discuss the Calgary financial crisis. They'll also discuss the restructuring of the Ottawa Rough Riders' ownership situation. And now let's return our attention to matters on the field. Uh, Don, the big story of the first half of this game those turnovers by the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. 
Well, Scott, you can't turn it over five times and hope to have success. And Joe, the last turnover resulted in a touchdown for Carl Brazley. Four interceptions during the first half. Carl Brazley is one of those old pros. You can't fool him. And they say the mark of a good defensive back is how many steps reaction does it take? And as you see, Carl Brazley key the quarterback's eyes. He takes one step and reacts in front of the receiver, Troy Johnson, and there's nobody here between him and touchdown. In a foot race, Carl Brazley wins it going 56 yards for the major score, and that came with less than a minute remaining in the half. At the time, the Argos only leading by a margin of 10 to 4, but the Brazley touchdown increased their advantage to 13 points. Is this one over? This is not, it's not over at all. Those big guys up front for Winnipeg, they're pushing people back. Mims is doing a good job. They got a chance. I think they can come back. It's a, it's a less than two touchdowns. Well, we see game. a quarterbacking change. Possible quarterbacking change, but four interceptions, and they're still in the ball game. I think that tells you something about Winnipeg's defense. Well, last week against the BC Lions, Coach Darrell Rogers made a quarterbacking change in the second half. Danny McManus replacing Tom Burgess. It might happen again tonight. And Danny did a good job last week, so who knows? He might be in there. We'll be back with the second half of this football game right after this. Well, the one key statistic of that first half is that second last item. Five turnovers by the Winnipeg Blue Bombers as they trail by a score of 17-4 after 30 minutes of play here at the Sky Dome. In Toronto's offense, a couple of big plays. One pass to Ismail and a run by Pinball Clemens. And who would have thought prior to the start of this football game that the Winnipeg Blue Bombers would more passes than rushes and the Toronto Argonauts just the reverse. They're changing uh, personalities there. I know Daryl Rogers wanted to establish the running game to have those good first downs and it looks like they got away from that a little bit in the second quarter. Danny McManus is warming up at the Winnipeg bench, an indication perhaps that Daryl Rogers is going to make a change and Willie Gillis, the backup quarterback for the Argos, also keeps his throwing arm the Toronto Argonauts, John Candy and Bruce McNall, the third member. Wayne Gretzky also in attendance tonight, but not down on the playing field here at the Sky Dome. Uncle Buck. Now that is a really wide receiver. Well, he has been very visible since assuming an ownership role with the Toronto Argonauts and he has assisted the league in attempting to market the product and there has been a definite improvement in the overall marketing scheme CFL since the McNall group took control of the Toronto football team. Well, you can feel it. There's a, there's a great deal of class involved in this organization, and I think the players exude that. No question the fans are having a good time. Well, Wayne Gretzky is watching the game from his seat in the Argo box as his partners, Candy and McNall, down at field level. Eric Streeter will handle the kickoffs to start the second half from the 26-yard line. Good blocking forming to the left. And Streeter gets it back to the Argo 51-yard line. That's a great return, and there's no question Eric Streeter is one of those underrated ball players. Everyone expected him to be out of the lineup with the emergence of Troy Johnson. I don't think it's going to happen. Streeter's a gamer. A 33-yard return. We thought that Danny McManus might start this second half, but Tom Burgess remains at the controls. He has passed for 172 yards. Ricky Foggy has only thrown for 41 yards, but Burgess has thrown the ball to the wrong colored jersey four times. I can remember on two occasions where it could have gone the other way, and I think this shows some class by uh, Daryl Rogers. He's saying, hey, this is my quarterback. We're going to get things going. He's a veteran. Burgess has done more good things than he has done bad, but unfortunately, he's had those turnovers. There's a delay because of an Argo injury. It is cornerback Ed Berry who is hurt. 
He went down in trying to make that tackle on the kickoff return by Eric Streeter. He'll probably move Grizzly out to the corner in the event that Barry is injured. And you can bet that they're going to be testing whoever goes in at defensive back. Donovan Wright is going to come into the ball game, taking Ed Berry's place. But as you suggested, they will move people around. Carl Brazley will go to the outside. Berry just gets caught up in the traffic here and uh, goes down underneath that pile. Well, there's a lot of uh, a lot of bodies in there, and it just didn't fit right with uh, the way he landed. So he he looks like he's okay. I, I hope he's all right. He's just a little bit woozy right now. But the Utah State product must stay out for at least three plays. One of the things that Daryl Rogers seems to have done is that he's he's selected not a system that he's used to, a wide open uh, offensive passing situ situation, but he's selected a system that will fit the team that he has right now. The slot backs, of course, are the people that are getting the ball most often, and that's the way he, he foresees this game going. Burgess going to Larry Willis. That's a first down at the 37 yard line. Well, that tells the coach that you're pretty happy with being able to play in the second half. He came out and did a super job on the curl pattern, delivering on the run, which isn't easy, and a nice catch by Larry Willis. First and 10, Winnipeg, the ball at the 37. If Burgess needed something to get him confidence in the second half, was hit that ball bounced up Daryl Ford made contact with Burgess the ball went right into the arms of Wright number 34 gets a 34 yard return Donovan Wright coming in on the halfback blitz gets picked up but Daryl Ford didn't get picked up and when you're blitzing two people in the back has to take one of them He's wrong because the other one gets to the quarterback, and that's what caused what is called another interception. But that was really a sack and a cough up of the football. However, it will go into the books as a fifth interception of this football game for the Argos, and they have a first and ten at the Winnipeg 31-yard line. They're in that bimbo package. The pass is complete to Daryl Smith. His first catch of the night. Three touchdowns this season. And he stopped at the 10-yard line. Well, Daryl Smith works to get open, and then he works even harder after he catches the football. He came back to the quarterback to get the ball, and now he's carrying people for another five yards. Good effort by Darrell K. Smith. He put the straight arm into the face of Ken Haley, and Michael Allen came over to make the tackle. First and ten. The yard goes just outside the ten-yard line. Foggy will run. Will he score? No. He stopped at the four. James West, the middle linebacker, came in to make uh, contact with Ricky Foggy. There are penalty flags on the play. Well, there, there's an Argo mixing it up with a defender, and it looks like there's going to be an unnecessary roughness penalty, but Foggy showed some leadership, pulling the ball down and taking it down to about the five-yard line. Well, the Argos were in that bimbo package where they have the two tight ends, and it was Kardash mixing it up with Eddie Taylor. Well, Kardash knows that he's ball. Unnecessary roughness. Toronto number 73. And Winnipeg number 43. Second down. Didn't mean to interrupt Jake, but he didn't say anything anyway on that one. But Kardash is trying to block that linebacker. They, they're in there specifically. The two tight ends are in there specifically to block the blitzing linebackers. Here it is, a little bit of a mix-up here. Grab the face mask, push the guy. What are you doing? We'll go out, have a beer after the game. They're not mad at each other. Now they come back with their six-back formation. Draw play. The quarterback, Foggy, is stopped at the two. Andrew Murray was uncovered. 
And that's what the spotter in the box will be telling them right now. Foggy was running all the way on that one. A quarterback draw with Ricky Foggy being stopped between the two and the three yard line by Paul Randolph. And Adam Rita sends in the field goal unit. Or when the fans don't want to see that. They wanted the six points, but you can't listen to the fans or you may be up in the stands is the way they say it. 12.07, the time remaining in this third quarter. Peyton and the pinball. It looks like a little snag. A little bit of a snag. It was by accident. You know, I shook hands with one of those wide receivers yesterday. Chomick is good as the Argos move into a 16-point lead. Anyone visiting the CN Tower tonight can look down through the roof of the Sky Dome as the Winnipeg Blue Bombers scrimmage first and 10 from the 35-yard line following that Lance Chomick field goal. Robert Mims trying to follow the blocking of Bob Molly is forced to cut back inside and will only get about two yards. That's a tough play to get into that sideline and run a sweep. There's just not a lot of room, particularly when you've got the size of those blockers that they have out in front of it. Rhoda Huskis is big enough just to take that whole sideline himself. There's another injured Toronto player. It's Mike Campbell. A lot of injuries this year in the Canadian Football League. A lot of very serious injuries. Sorry, it's Hallman, not Campbell. Hallman's been having trouble, and it looks like he's in the back area. He's holding something yeah, in the back area. Saying. Very often, a big guy like that, he loses 10 or 15 pounds of, of uh, liquid during a ball game, and they get cramps, and it's not always a serious injury, and hopefully that's the situation. Hallman was shaken up earlier in the football game, but did not leave. However, this time he will be going out. It is Mike Campbell who is down on one knee checking to see what the problem is with his teammate. Campbell would rather have him not be hurt because he doesn't want to have to carry him off the field. They don't like to carry the big guys off the field. That's why they don't get hurt often. It could, he doesn't look like he made any... Oh, I guess... Uh, I guess that face mask, he's got a Rydell dug in the middle of his back, and uh, that's the problem. Could be in the rib area. Really painful, but hopefully not serious. Nick Benjamin coming in on top of Harold Hallman. And Hallman is still down. Nick Benjamin loves to run down people. He loves to run down his defensive people and make some blocks. Well, Clemens has outperformed Robert Mims so far in this football game, but most of Clemens' yardage came on that one big effort. You know, Adam Rita said that he wanted Augie to run like a scalded dog. Well, I think he's got a guy that runs like a rabbit going across the crowded freeway trying to avoid traffic in that pinball. He is something else. Well, the Rocket may have the flat-out speed, but pinball has all those good lateral moves that cause defensive, uh, defensive spits. Harold Hallman is still down in obvious pain after taking that hit in the back from Nick Benjamin. 11.26 is the time remaining here at the Sky Dome in the third quarter with Toronto leading 20 to 4. Second down play, second and eight. Napierkowski has replaced Hallman defensively for the Argos. We're just being forced by Darrell Ford. He threw it away. Ford's been quiet up to this point. Uh, this ball game, he's really come out of his own and shown some great acceleration to the football here. And he just, Burgess has no other choice but to let the ball go or he's going to be sacked. Great play by Daryl Ford. Bob Cameron stands at his own 23 yard line for the third down punt. A 
23 yard kick by Bob Cameron. He was trying to angle it out of bounds, but he wanted a little more depth on that third down punt. Well, Ricky Foggy remains at the controls of the Argos. He hasn't had a great night, but he's been aided by a tremendous defensive effort that has produced five turnovers, five interceptions, actually, and six turnovers in total. That hitch screen to the rocket, but that draws a crowd, and he's taken out of bounds by Eddie Taylor. Very forcibly, uh, we might add, he's taken out of bounds. I don't like that play, Don. I, you know, they got somebody out there to do the blocking on it, but uh, it really is predicated on someone missing a tackle, and I don't think you're going to find a Winnipeg Blue Bombers missing many tackles. In fact, it hurts a little bit when uh, they don't miss a tackle. Watch this follow through to the ground. A gain of two, it's second and eight. The Argos again in that two tight end formation. The pass is complete to Daryl Smith. He loses the football. He managed to get it back. Well, Foggy has them guessing now because they didn't blitz. Normally they would have good contain on the receivers. Straight up zone coverage, but Foggy's out around the corner. Michael Gray's the only one with a chance. And then Foggy, before passing line of scrimmage, just dumps it off to Daryl K. Smith. And who dribbled it for another yard. First and ten from the Winnipeg 45. Fake handoff to Clemens. Foggy running away from Randolph and overthrowing Daryl K. Smith. Well, Randolph made that play. He wasn't fooled. He came back to the outside. Foggy had the corner, but he did try to throw it. Couldn't get across his body, running to the left and throwing with the right hand. But Randolph, all the way, is... Lance Chomick has replaced Hank Alyssa in civvies as the Argo punter, in addition to his place-kicking chores. And Alyssic down on the bench is helping Chomick stay loose. Good job. It's amazing when you think of Hank Alyssic's career. He came into the Good CFL job. when he was just 17 years of age. Well, what's amazing is to see Hank's son kick the football as well as his dad. Clement appears to have the first down. They ruled he didn't step out of bounds until he got to the 33. And that is a Toronto first down. That guy is on a different speed than everybody else on this field. It's that delay draw. He came back to the outside. He takes the corner and knows that he needs the first down. He's all the way past Randolph before they even know where they are. You think that two tight end formation caught Winnipeg a little by surprise? No question about it. The linebackers are used to playing against nobody, and now they're playing against a big, tough offensive lineman. could not hang on. The ex-Winnipeg Blue Bomber over on the sidelines working against Eddie Taylor and just couldn't haul in that throw from Ricky Foggy. Well, it hit his hands and uh, you know what they say, when the ball's in your hands, you got to make that catch. It was a difficult catch. Jeff laid out for it. Couldn't quite control it. He caught the back end of the football instead of the front end of it. Second and 10. The ball is at the 33. The toss to Clement. Puts it back inside. Penalty flag on the play. The ball comes loose. I think the Argos got it back, but it could be a holding call against Toronto. And the holding call enabled Clemens to cut back inside. The problem with playing the uh, two tight ends, those people, just like the linebackers, aren't used to playing out there. Neither are the two tight ends. They're linemen. They're not used to having to hold somebody that long, hold a block that hey, long. Schmidt appeared to be guilty of holding. Let's see. Holding. Toronto number 78. Repeat second down. So you can hold inside. Between the tackles, there's all kinds of holding going on. But when you get that jersey number on that you're a tight end, you can't hold. The referee can see too well. 
Clemens to cut back inside, but it resulted in the flag taking the ball back to the 43. It's second and 20 Toronto. The Argos lead 20 to 4 with 751 remaining in the third quarter. a good job of protection. Super job of protection to give Foggy the time for Boyd to work his way open. You can't cover a receiver that long. And it was slightly underthrown. Boyd had the opportunity to work the, re to work the defensive back. Makes his break. The ball's underthrown. He still has time to come back and make the catch. 28-yard gain, Foggy to Jeff Boyd. It's first and 10, Toronto. They are at the Winnipeg 14. Hand off to Clemens. Penalty flag on the play again. And some after-the-whistle action. Feelings run high between these two teams. I suggested to Adam Rita yesterday that this had developed into a rather bitter rivalry. He laughed and said, no, it's not bitter. It's out-and-out out hatred. Well, when somebody beats you five times and you've got uh, the offense that blows the lights out uh, and you don't do that against that team, you have a tendency to want to do as well as you possibly can and rub it in if possible. Well, that's what the Argos suggested they would attempt to do against Winnipeg if given the opportunity. But as many points on the board as they possibly could. The last time that Toronto scored a win over Winnipeg was October 1st, 1989. That was in Winnipeg. The score was 24-17. Well, they wanted to shoot the lights out and blow the roof off. The roof is off. Holding. Toronto number 56. Sexual conduct. Winnipeg number 12. Repeat first down. with another crowd of 40,000 plus at the Sky Dome. The fans tonight are enjoying themselves again as they did in the Argos' home debut against the Hamilton Ticats last week. 6.50 remaining in this third quarter. That was a teddy bear. All offensive line fans like teddy bears. Chunky guys. From the 14, they'll repeat the first down. Tight end formation again with Schmidt and Kardash in the lineup. Foggy will run. Stan Nicholas in pursuit. He can't catch him. But Michael Allen, the safety, takes Foggy out of bounds with help from Greg Battle. Foggy was not happy that uh, Battle was just a little aggressive as they went out of bounds. Just a little aggressive. He rolled up over top of the leg. It's a common ploy. Give a little twist. But Foggy has got that innate ability to react, and uh, that's what makes a good quarterback. When the receivers aren't open, he instantaneously reacts to running with the ball. At the end of the play, you see Battle doing a little twist to follow it up. Second and one. by Peyton, but I think he got enough for the first down prior to being forced back by the rookie linebacker. That's a nice football tackle. He took him and put his shoulder right in where he bends and takes him back where he came from, and he said, uh-uh, not this time. Good football play. Alfred Peyton making the hit on Kelly, but not before he got the first down. It's first and goal. Toronto, they are at the four of Winnipeg, leading by a score of 20 to four, with 5.30 remaining in this third quarter. The Argos looking for their third straight win. Kelly, the ball carrier, he got to the line of scrimmage and then driven back by Mike Gray with help from Greg Battle. Well, they were in a twist stunt with the backers and it completely confused Toronto. They weren't able to pick up the solid blocking up front that they needed. Argo merchandise, much more visible in the city this year than it has been in the past. The Argos opening their own store here at the Sky Dome, the end zone, selling not only Argo merchandise, but CFL merchandise. And uh, the fans have been snapping it up. Foggy. 
in some trouble. Michael Allen from his safety position came up to make the tackle at the six yard line. I believe I said that that Argo uh, end zone boutique was here at the Sky Dome. It's on King Street actually about uh, two blocks from the Sky Dome. That's a good football play by the outside. Uh, Paul Randolph made Augie Belly all the way to the sideline and then of course Michael Allen came up to make the tackle, but it was a good job of hand fighting and skating to the outside by Paul Randolph. You know, a lot of people were asking what the Argos would do with the Rocket tonight. Well, they were hoping to get him the football. He was wide open in the end zone, but Foggy obviously didn't see him. And Joe, I don't think uh, they're even close to getting the football in his hands as often as they had hoped for coming into the game. Well, they'd like to run a wide open offense, but at least what they're seeing now is that they, in order to control the backers, they have to use this two tight end offense. They need their protection. Adams Reed has sort of gotten away from that philosophy that he used last year of emptying out the backfield. And I think it's because he's had his quarterback injured and foggy with the bruised shoulder. I don't think he wants to go into this the way he went into those games last year with a wide open offense. He's using two tight ends. I think he's concerned with his quarterback protection and his health. Jeff Boyd, the injured Argo receiver. He played his first game, the season opener against Ottawa, with only one day's practice and emerged from that game as their leading receiver with seven receptions. Lance Chomick has made both field goals tonight. He's now three for three and has 11 for the season. 4-16 remains in the third quarter. Toronto leading Winnipeg, 23-4. touchdown and that was set up by a big interception return by Don Wilson the Argos other touchdown by Carl Brasley on an interception return the Winnipeg defense hasn't played badly tonight Joe despite all the changes they have had to make but when you turn the ball over six times five of them on interceptions you're going to be in trouble I've seen Randolph and Peyton both make some really good plays, so I don't think it's the fault of the defense it's the field position they find themselves in most of the game Eric Streeter is taken out of bounds on the kickoff return at the 37 by Donovan Wright. That was a 21-yard run back. The Argos trying to make it three in a row tonight, and next Thursday, they'll travel to the West Coast to take on the BC Lions. The Lions tonight are playing the Edmonton Eskimos, and that game will begin at 10.30 Eastern Time. Toronto at British Columbia next Thursday night on the CFL on CBC Television. Well, Burgess wants to get something going. He's got to get a score to get back into the ball game, and they're not out of it. He was looking inside for Rick House, incomplete. And again, as we saw earlier in the ball game, the ball deflecting away from House and very nearly into the arms of an Argo defender. Second and 10 from the 38. Larry Willis goes wide right. Eric Streeter to the left. Prefo and House are the slot backs. Burgess won't get a chance to throw as Harold Hallman comes into the ball game, pops the ball loose, and Toronto has recovered. Turnover number seven. right through and makes a good shot but they're, they're concerned with the backer coming in and Holman beats the shoulder penalty flag as Ismail is tripped up in the end zone Foggy 
was attempting to go to the rocket in the end zone on the first play following the turnover. And Ismail got tripped up in the end zone, drawing a penalty fly. Forward pass interference. Winnipeg number 16 in the end zone. First down and one. So it is first and goal Toronto from the one-yard line. Well, pass interference is, did they make contact? Did the defender hinder the offensive receiver? And I don't think there's any question about this. The ball was catchable. Ricky Foggy keeps for his second touchdown of the game. Bombers defensively were anticipating he'd try and go over the middle. He went to the outside and had a clear path into the end zone. Almost like a scalded dog. offensive touchdown but you credit the defense with another score on that one the fumble recovery by Chris Gaines setting it up incredible number of turnovers and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers did the pinch Ricky Foggy had smooth sailing to the outside they were all washed up to the inside nobody for Ricky outside Lance Chomick with the point after with 2.57 remaining in the third quarter, the Argos are threatening to turn this one into a complete rout. Danny McManus is now up and throwing at the Winnipeg bench. And there are some, judging by the number of turnovers that Tom Burgess has been guilty of tonight, who may be wondering why a quarterbacking change was not made a little earlier, if in fact one is going to be made now. When you look at the quarterback situation, if he's hit in the back, that's a tough situation. But Danny McManus, he'd like to get in there and show what he can do, and it's probably not a bad time to get him in. Burgess has to be tremendously frustrated because he's been hit all sorts of ways, and he's had some bad luck tonight as well. Toronto leading 30-4 to with 2.57 remaining in the third quarter. Reader and Johnson await this kickoff from Lance Chomick. Looks like there's an AWOL player on the special teams. That won't make Daryl Rogers very happy. Warren Hudson picks it up at the 30-yard line, and Hudson brings the ball back to the 49. Stopped there by Chris Gaines, and Danny McManus is coming onto the field as the Winnipeg quarterback. That was a 19-yard run back by Warren Hudson. Well, what McManus wants to do now is he's got to start his own game plan. He can't think about the score. He's got to get in, take the team down, get some points. He's got to do it his way and not think that he's got to make up 24, 26 points that quickly. Get him back in the ball game, then let things work. First and 10, the ball is at the 48. Winnipeg on almost every offensive series has enjoyed good field position. But those seven turnovers have been their undoing. Warren Hudson, the ball carrier, for a gain of about three. Chris Gaines was there to make the tackle. You know, sometimes you think uh, Ricky Foggy is sponsored by the Dental Association. He's always smiling and always happy. Uh, I've even seen him get sacked. I've seen him get hit tremendously hard, gets back up and puts that big smile on. And you know he's going to be successful because he exudes success. It's always easier to smile when you're leading by a score of 30 to 4. And a receiver like Daryl K. Smith next to you helps. Second and six, Winnipeg. McManus looking for Treefel, almost intercepted by Carl Braisley. Braisley had good position on Prefo, and even though Prefo stands 6'6", Braisley got in there to knock it down. Carl is uh, such an instinctive ball player. We were talking about him never taking a bad step. And uh, what, what does it take to react? And when you're a defensive back, you have to be able to react instantaneously. That's what he did, knock the ball down. Well, there seems to be all sorts of confusion with Winnipeg on this third down punt. Players uncertain who should be on the field, who should be out. Well, it must have been a fake punt call. That's the only reason there would be anything like that happen. They were probably going to use a fake punt. They had a special team assigned for it. All of the players didn't get the call. They know who the punt team is. They didn't know who the fake punt team was. The ball bounces away from Ismail. Clemens is back as well. 
Clemens finally picks it up and moves it out to the 10 yard line. And again, some uh, pushing and shoving involving Bruce Elliott, who lost his helmet in the process. Scott? Well, Don, here on the Argo bench, bad news for receiver Jeff Boyd. He has aggravated his hamstring on his left thigh and is unlikely to return tonight. That's a very common injury these days in the CFL. But the good news is the Argos still have five quality receivers to go around. A lot of offensive talent on the roster of the Toronto Argonauts. I shook Jeff Boyd's hand yesterday. Those gloves he had on, I couldn't get my hand away from his. Those gloves are uh, made out of glue or something. I had to be surgically removed. Asadi has replaced Jeff Boyd as the Argo wideout. First and 10, Foggy rolls out and will be caught from behind by Quincy Williams. That's what Ricky Foggy didn't want to have happen. Vincy Williams took him down hard on that bad shoulder. Took a hard hit, and when you're holding the football, your shoulder's in an awkward position. It's not a good way to land. It's not a natural way to land when you're holding that football against your ribs. So we'll see what Foggy does if he has to throw this time. This time, Masati lines up to the left. Goes in that two tight end formation penalty flag on the play. There was movement on the part of the Argos prior to the ball being snapped. It appeared as though Schmidt, coming from the right side, moved prematurely. He's number 78. But well, we talked about that procedure. Toronto number 78 decline. Third down. There's a problem when you're outside as a tight end. A definite problem. Willie Gillis warming up at that Toronto bench and an indication perhaps that with just 21 seconds remaining in this third quarter and the Argos in front 30 to 4 that the backup will see some action tonight. If it's not because of Foggy hitting the ground there and getting hurt, it's because Adam Rita saw him hit the ground and he's concerned and he didn't throw the ball, remember, on that play. It was a run to Clements. So Foggy may have been sh shaken up a little bit on that last play. Climbers will get the ball back in excellent field position. Troy Johnson and Eric Streeter awaiting the kick by Lance Chomick. Streeter takes it at the Toronto 48-yard line and dives through to the 42. Bruce Elliott was there to make the initial contact on a five-yard return by Eric Streeter. And that is also the final play of the third quarter here at the Sky Dome with Toronto comfortably ahead of Winnipeg. will start the fourth quarter first and ten from the Toronto 42 yard line Danny McManus replacing Tom Burgess late in the third quarter he's the Winnipeg quarterback handoff to Robert Mims and Mims picks up about eight yards statistically the Bombers haven't fared that badly in the football game despite the 30 to 4 score but those seven turnovers will cause even the best defensive unit, all sorts of trouble. Seven turnovers usually means about 45 points. And um, it's incredible the uh, amount of first downs that Winnipeg had in a game that's this lopsided at this point. Second and two, Winnipeg. Mims again reaching for the 30-yard line, and he has a first down. Stopped there by Chris Gaines. Rogers, the rookie head coach of the Bombers, saw his club open with a 23-9 triumph over the Hamilton Tiger Cats. Then in overtime last week, lose to the BC Lions 26-23. And tonight, the Bombers are being hammered 30-4 by the Argos. A lack of execution was a Winnipeg problem in the game last week. Turnovers have been the problem tonight against Toronto. McManus throwing into the end zone for Larry Dawn Wilson. They 
roll their coverage, and Don Wilson had actually the deep half of the field on that side, and he did a great job of just reacting to the ball while it's in the air. Throw a little bit of a rainbow, and that gave Wilson a chance to come back and knock the ball away. That's what zone coverage is predicated on, the ability to react to the football when it's thrown on a lofting pattern like that. Second and 10, the ball is at the 30-yard line. McManus throwing to the end zone again for Troy Johnson. He got tangled up with the defensive back, Reggie Pleasant, and the ball was behind him. There's a penalty flag at the line of scrimmage. Reggie Pleasant made the defender go the way he wanted him to go. And that's the mark of a good defensive back. You make the receiver go. He defended an area. Offside, Winnipeg number 14. Decline, third down. Good play by Reggie Pleasant for defending his half of the field. Taking away anything that might have been on that inside. Penalty is declined by the Argos, and it remains third and ten from the 30, and the Bombers, trailing by 26, are going for it. McManus to Rick House for the first down. Don Wilson made the tackle down at the 17-yard line. Good, solid football play. That's what Danny McManus needs. He needs to be able to complete some passes, keep the... Ball moving towards the goal line. Watch yourself. Watch yourself. Watch yourself. First and ten, Winnipeg. The ball is at the Toronto 17-yard line. Bill Rogers is tired of hearing all those yeah buts. Low throw intended for Crepo. It will be second and ten. Ryan Warren was coming on a blitz and almost got to McManus from the backside. Well, Steve Rota Huskis was trying to pick Brian up from the backside and uh, had good pressure from Brian Warren. Second and 10, the ball is at the 17. Daryl Smith has scored three touchdowns in the first two games for the Argos but has not been able to put it in the end zone tonight. He equaled the league record, of course, last year with 20 touchdowns. Rob Crepo for the major score as McManus led him perfectly into the end zone. Carl Brasley was blitzing, and the Bombers picked it up, and Crepo had a clear path into the end zone. McManus drops back, and he sees the blitz coming, no one in its man coverage, and puts the ball down field to his inside receiver. Perfect throw. Nice pickup of the halfback blitz. So Rob Crepo came into the ball game as a replacement for the injured Ken Wine. puts it in the end zone, and the Bombers will go after the two-point conversion with 11.53 remaining in this fourth quarter. for Rick House, knocked away by Darrell Ford. Bombers have moved to within 20, but only 11.53 remains. We'll be back with the Winnipeg kickoff after this. Well, the Bombers led this football game after 15 minutes of play, but even though they were in front after the opening quarter, there were indications that they were going to self-destruct. They have turned the ball over three times in the first 15 minutes, and their total turnovers now stand at seven. You got to hand it to the Toronto defense. That's I what think, they've been doing. And they have certainly handled, handed it to them. The rocket on the kickoff return brings the ball to the Winnipeg 52. Ill-conceived onside kick or kangaroo kick or whatever you're going to do, don't give the Rocket the ball in the open field. And that's exactly what they did. Everybody bunched to the left, and the Rocket went where there wasn't much population and showed what he had. Good speed. 
20-yard run back for the Rocket, taking the ball to the 52-yard line. We thought that Willie Gillis might come on as the Toronto quarterback, but Coach Adam Rita has opted to stay with Ricky Foggy. He has not posted impressive numbers tonight, but he does have his team in front by 20 points. Only 11.32 remaining in the game here at the Sky Dome. There's the toss to the Rocket. the initial hit and then got some help from Eddie Taylor. I think the rocket was looking downfield. There may have been a possibility of an option pass coming here, but the receivers were covered, so he took it up inside. But I think he was looking initially to maybe throw that football. What a smooth athlete. I like the way I like the way his legs go and his body upper body stays straight. Second and four. Ricky Foggy trying to run for a first down. He won't get there as he got to the 39 yard or 44 yard line stopped there by Paul Randolph. Well, the reactionary speed of the Winnipeg defense has done this time and again to Toronto. They haven't let them run with their quarterbacks. They've given them all kinds of swarming type defense and they can't the quarterbacks just can't seem to get the run going that's not like ricky foggy to not pick up that first down well as we said earlier the uh, winnipeg defense certainly hard hit by injuries coming into this football game and even though the argos have recorded 30 points it has not been the fault of the defense tonight seven turnovers the defense of toronto they've been getting pressure They've been tipping the ball. They've been sacking quarterbacks. They've been coming up with fumble recoveries, interceptions. Direct snap to Kevin Smelly, but an excellent play by Brendan Rodgers. That's nice to see the score the way it is, to see Winnipeg come back and really fight like that on the fake punt. That's great. That's good to see because that's a good football team. They're not giving up. They're staying in this ball game. And Danny McManus having that score. There's some good things to build with. Brendan Rodgers, a fourth-round draft choice of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. He played at the University of East Washington, and he has won himself a position with the football team as a backup linebacker. And on special teams, he comes up with a key play, forcing the turnover at the 48-yard line. Ten minutes remaining in the game. Danny McManus continues to direct the Winnipeg attack. McManus underneath to Rick House, and Rick House will get the first down. He stopped at the 50 of the Argos. They catch them in zone coverage, and what they want to do is throw it right in front of those linebackers, let the receiver turn up field and get the first down, and that's exactly what they did. Rick House coming all the way across, turns up field. You know, that guy must be about, what, 45 years old, and he still catches that football and makes some first downs. That's his sixth reception of the ball game. He's been the favorite target of the Winnipeg quarterbacks. Tom Burgess, who started the ball game, Danny McManus, who has taken over, and now directs the attack from the 50-yard line. Warren Hudson gets the call. Hudson bounces off a couple of tackles to the Toronto 43-yard line. Daryl Ford in there to make the tackle. Ford has really played a strong ball game tonight for Toronto. Well, that's who we've seen all night, number 21. He's all over the field. And he you know, he's just a Marine. He's on the air and on the land and on the special teams. You know, he's done a good job of coming up, making the support, doing a good job on the runs, and then he does a good job on the pass defense and a good job on special teams. Second and three, Winnipeg. Johnson wide left. Larry Willis to the right. Hudson gets the call again. Penalty flag in the play as Hudson gets the first down, but let's wait for the penalty call. It's offside against Toronto. Let's go. Offside. John number 70. Decline. First down. Let's go. James West, the leader of that Winnipeg defensive unit. He misses his teammate Tyrone Jones. Well, James West is a one-man wrecking crew, and he's got to be. Look at the perspiration. It's hot down on the field. Very hot. Winnipeg with 22 first downs compared to 12 for the Argos. McManus for Willis. There's a collision down at the two-yard line. 
Pass is incomplete as Willis bumped with Don Wilson. Rodney Harding was pressuring quarterback Danny McManus. 8-17 remains in the ball game. Larry Willis sold him to the outside and then took the ball up, but he leaves his feet a little bit too soon to get the pass interference call because both people are allowed to get the ball. Wilson's allowed to get it. So is Willis. No, no inter interference call. No hinder. Second and ten. Rick House in the sidelines for a first down at the 22. That's a great play by Danny McManus because he was getting pressure. He had people in his face. Hard for a quarterback to complete a ball when there are people right in his face. And Don Moan looked like he was going to get a sack, but McManus delivered the ball on time. Winnipeg's been moving the football down the field every time they get it. House leads the Winnipeg passing attack. Seven receptions for 93 yards. Mims the ball carrier inside the 20-yard line. Winnipeg has moved the football well, but they haven't been able to uh, maintain control of it. Interceptions and fumbles. Seven turnovers in total. That's the problem. Uh, it certainly hasn't been a case where they, they've been stymied. That they've, they've been smothered. Nobody has really done that to him. Harold Hallman feeling those... He probably said, somebody get that helmet out of my back. It feels like it's still stuck in there with that face mask. reminds me of uh, Nick Araki that used to play for Montreal. He's uh, got the height, he's got the range, and he's, as Daryl Rogers said yesterday, all we need for this big guy to do is to catch the ball during the game. He needs that kind of practice to catch the ball in the game, and that's what he's doing. He's catching the ball in the game. He's getting more confident with each catch. So the Blue Bombers are first and goal from the two-yard line, and there's an injured Toronto player. It's Rodney Harding. 6.51 is the time remaining. Danny McManus now directing the Winnipeg attack. We remind you this program is copyrighted and is strictly for the private use of our audience. Any rebroadcast, retransmission, exhibition, distribution in whole or in part without the express written consent of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation is strictly prohibited. It will be Winnipeg first and goal from the two when we return in the fourth quarter tonight here at the Sky Dome with Winnipeg first and goal from the Toronto two-yard line. They're working on the right leg of Rodney Harding. Napier Kowski is in there in his spot. The ball goes to Mims and he's found the end zone. This guy is a football player. I've been so impressed with him on uh, the interceptions. He makes the tackle. Uh, on fumbles, he makes the recovery. And on the goal line, he makes the touchdowns. And uh, he's the kind of guy, when he was about 12 years old, everybody chose him first when they were playing touch tackle. Well, he beat Tim Jesse out of the job last year, and he played every game for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers and led the league in rushing and he is the CFL's leading rusher again this year and he fights his way into the end zone behind the block of Chris Walby and again Winnipeg is attempting a two-point convert. Knocked away intended for Johnson Reggie Pleasant got over there to knock it down. Well, this is just a run to daylight kind of situation. Uh, Mims took the football. He's just running, and then he takes the cut back when he sees it wide. Open up, shoulder square to the line of scrimmage, and runs through about three people. See the whole small little seam, and he finds it. Runs through the people. What's an arm or a leg? That's not going to stop me. And he's in for the touchdown. Last year during regular season play, Winnipeg won all four games against the Argos. They also won a playoff game and a preseason game this year. These two teams meet three times this year. Tonight, of course, here at the Sky Dome, they play again on October 5th in Toronto and then on October 11th in Winnipeg. So they have back-to-back -back games early in October. Many people anticipated that Toronto and Winnipeg would be battling for first place in the Eastern Division this year. So far, that looks like that's the way it's going to be. 
there's that buzz of excitement among the spectators as the Rocket handles the ball but doesn't get beyond the 40-yard line. Leon Hotziano made the tackle. So many times you see a guy like the Rocket uh, will make an all-or-nothing play, but that's not the case of the Rocket. Greg Hip is able to get up and make yardage, make good, solid yardage. What did uh, coaches say? Quiet yardage, but nevertheless, yardage towards the goal line. He's not an all-or-nothing player. He always goes towards the goal line and makes yards. Well, Winnipeg desperately needs to get that ball back with the clock running. Now under six minutes remaining in the game. They need a two-and-out situation. And if they can continue to contain Clemens the way they just did, they'll get that ball back quickly. Quincy Williams made the tackle after the play was initially forced by Bob Evans. Well, the bimbo formation is changing a little bit about Toronto. They're a tight offensive unit now. They're, they're not spreading people out like they have in the past. Now, it's been effective to keep the blitzing down, but they really haven't been the same offensive threat that uh, you see a normal Toronto team when they use their six-pack. makes the catch but he won't get the first down he got back to the original line of scrimmage and was tackled there by James West and Bob Evans so it's two and out with 505 remaining in the ball game Troy Johnson and Eric Streeter go back for the third down kick by Lance Chomick see a little bit of pride with the uh, Winnipeg defense they're showing that they're not going to give up because there's a few touchdowns difference they're going to keep in there and fight and uh, Wild West comes up and makes solid hits every time he's playing a terrific ball game the Argos of course using up as much time as possible with every play they're not quite as relaxed at that Toronto bench as they were earlier in the football game well you can sense Very close to a block kick, but you can sense that the Winnipeg's gaining some confidence. Troy Johnson takes it out of bounds at the 43, or Eric Streeter, I should say, takes it out of bounds. That's where Winnipeg will scrimmage when we return. Well, trailing by 14 with 4.41 remaining, there's still time for Winnipeg. Three minutes is a lifetime in the CFL. The clock stops after each play. They, they have a lot of time. If they score on this drive, we're going to have a great finish. And off inside to Robert Mims. Mims breaks a couple of tackles and then takes a good hit at about the 48-yard line. Rhoda Huskis and Walby have a big job to do. They have to do some turnout blocking, and they've been doing a super job of that. Daryl Ford's reaction time, of course, is the big thing. He comes over and does a great job of picking up Mims on the cutback. It will be second and five, Winnipeg. 30 to 16 the score. The Argos leading. It was 34 Toronto at one point, but Winnipeg has scored the last two touchdowns. Listening to Daryl Rogers yesterday uh, talk about the officiating. I had a situation once as a coach. I was standing on the sidelines and yelling, they're holding, they're holding, they're holding the whole game. With three minutes to go in the game, I'm still yelling, they're holding. Jake Ireland came over and said, you know, you have the ball. I said, I know it, but I just want you to call one holding call. <laughs> Daryl Rogers with a major college coaching career at Arizona State and Michigan State before going to the Detroit Lions. This has got to upset Daryl a little bit. He's trying to get this thing going. He wants to get the... Um, offensive unit moving downfield like they have been. They've been going in the right direction. They just haven't been taking the ball with them all the time. One of the problems is with the time clock. They're going to have to put more time back on the clock. And that's one of the reasons that Jake Ireland has gone over to the timekeeper's bench. Winnipeg has scored two touchdowns in this fourth quarter when it looked as though the Argos were home and cooled out. Who would have thought the Sky Dome would have this much of an advantage? Uh, remember talking about whether the roof is on or off and how the crowd noise affects the teams. 
it doesn't matter. This roof is off, and you can still sense that crowd, the electricity there. And that is Darryl's, Darryl K. Smith's nephew, I believe. And his name is Sherman. Well, they just put two seconds back in the clock. On second down. Warren Hudson fights to the 50-yard line. 3.52 is the time remaining. Moan and Napierkowski made the tackle. I think they're going to go for it here. They're just, uh, they try to change up, but I think on third down, they're still trying to get down and make some points. Ford in on the tackle. Uh, Daryl Ford, I mean, he has been all over the field tonight. We've seen him more tonight, I think, than the first two ball games. Winnipeg on third down and three going after it trailing by 14 points. Warren Hudson trying to get outside, trying to get the first down. He's going to be stopped short. Gaines and Ford both came over to make the tackle. Now Gaines uh, had the challenge tonight. He had to come out and make some big plays. And he certainly did do that. He just... Olaid threw the blocker aside and came over and made the hit along with his partner, Daryl Ford. You like to see a linebacker sandwich. That's when one linebacker is on each side of a ball carrier. A linebacker sandwich. Don't Chris that, Gaines. Does that surprise you at all? The Bombers, three consecutive plays, running the football with time running out? Well, I, I, what surprised me was that Mims wasn't one of those on the last two carries. The Argos take over. The ball at the Winnipeg 52. Keith Kelly is stopped right at the line of scrimmage. Well, we've seen a different Toronto Argo team with the two tight. 2.55 is the time remaining as the Argos go after their third straight win. Well, Darrell Rogers and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers desperately have to get that football back, but time is running out on their last series. They opted to run on three consecutive plays, and it's another turnover as they failed to make down. Held on downs. Cal Murphy, the general manager of the Winnipeg football team, won't be happy with what he has witnessed tonight as far as his offense is concerned and the number of turnovers that they committed. Well, I think it's in a neighborhood of eight turnovers, and that's incredible in one ball game. gamble and fail on third down that's considered a turnover as far as the statistics are concerned well it's two and out the defense again has done its job with 239 remaining in the ball game good pressure on Ricky Foggy he didn't have a chance to let his James West was in he didn't have a chance to let his arm go into full range of motion the ball fell way short we used to have a sled, a blocking sled, uh, when I played in Ashtabula Zippers, and it was called Big Bertha. When you, when you played where? For the Ashtabula Zippers, <laughs> it was a semi-pro team, and that sled had seven dummies on it, and they were just pushing each other back, and I've seen that so much tonight. A lot of people pushing each other back. Very surprising for this game. Troy Johnson takes it at the three-yard line. And he is stopped at the nine. 2.28 is the time remaining. Good kick by Lance Chomick. They didn't rush Lance that time, and he got off a nice kick. Early in the game, they were giving him quite a bit of pressure. 47-yard kick that time by Chomick. Long way to go for a touchdown uh, from your own nine-yard line, but... You know Winnipeg wants to get down there and score and then try an onside kick. And hey, 228, they've got time. Well, we suggested they had time the last time they had the football with 446 remaining. Unfortunately, now they've got a lot more field with that time. McManus completes the pass to Rick House. Well, Ed Berry's sort of laying in the weeds, and he wants to come in and hit him where there aren't any pads. He hit him right under 
the shoulder pads and up above the hip pads, and that's where you sort of lose a little bit of wind, and I think that's what's happened. Rick has lost a little bit of his wind. Well, this is Rick House's 13th season in the CFL. He hung on to that football despite taking the hit from Ed Berry. Rick initially coming into the league with Winnipeg in 1979. He went to Edmonton in 1985, but returned to the Bombers in 1989. I mentioned that uh, he was a 1,000-yard receiver in 1981, and that actually was his most productive year in the CFL. Well, he showed a lot of courage on that play because he knew he was going to be hit. He concentrated on bringing that ball in. And uh, he's still on the ground. I think it's probably in a situation where he just needs some more, some more air. Uh, he looks like he's all right. That's good to see him get up. Good, good job, Rick. He played a nice game tonight. He's been a lot of their offense. He's been a major portion of the Winnipeg passing attack tonight. Matt Pierce will now have to come into the ball game and run out of the slot back position because Ken Whiney was injured earlier. So Matt Pierce will have to be in there for at least three plays. First and 10, Winnipeg. The ball is at the 27. McManus to Crefo, and Crefo is open up at the 49. Two minutes remaining in the game. Well, that would make me wonder why those three running plays in the last drive, because McManus certainly looks like he's got a command of the offense. 22-yard gain on the pass to Rob Crefo. He scored a touchdown in the fourth quarter. Now the clock starts. McManus to Crefo again. There's a penalty flag on the play. Crefo presents a big target, six foot six. Manus, with House now out of there, is looking for him inside. And this penalty is against Toronto. Major foul, roughing the passer. Toronto number 99, first down. Well, those are the kinds of things you don't want to see in this particular situation in the ball game. You've got to keep your head and you've got to play solid defense because they're still in the ball game if they get a score. And there's the hit. McManus after he threw the football. McManus to Crefo again down at the 25-yard line. This should be close to another Winnipeg first down with 147 remaining. Crefo looks like a tight end. He is one of those big guys, a big target. That's what quarterbacks like to have, somebody they can find when things get tough. House out of there for the obligatory three plays, and now he's back in for Winnipeg at that slot back position. There was a mix-up there with the receiver, Larry Willis, and the quarterback, McManus. Willis stopped at the 10-yard line, and McManus thought he was heading for the end zone. 139 is the time remaining. Holman still remembers that helmet in his back, so he put his helmet into Danny McManus's front. Good, clean football players get even in good, clean ways. Johnson comes out. Eric Streeter goes in for Winnipeg. McManus keeping on third down and about a yard. It's going to be close. Let's see where they spot it. Offside. But there was number 99. First down. There was a penalty on the play, and it is an automatic first down for Winnipeg at the 21. Rick House is out again. Matt Pierce is in at the slot back spot. Into the end zone, Ed Berry thought he had an interception. It was intended for Larry Willis. It looked like Willis distracted him just enough with his extended arms to break up the play. 131 remaining. Willis stopped running and looked like he might have had it had he bent inside. Robert Mims, the ball carrier, 
down to the 15-yard line. Stopped by Darrell Ford with 126 remaining. Bruce McNall. Now, I wonder what he thought of Brendan Shanahan signing yesterday with the St. Louis Blues. The owner of the Los Angeles Kings has uh, thrown he around. Said, oh, that's peanuts. <laughs> Incomplete intended for Robert Mims. So on third down, the Toronto Argonauts take over as Winnipeg fails to convert. And that should do it with only 120 remaining here at the Sky Dome. Well, I don't think McManus uh, feels particularly good about this ball game, but he did show something. He came in, performed well. He, he put the ball in the air. He got, uh, he found Crapo. He had some receivers injured. He certainly didn't have Whiny when he wanted him in there. Uh, House was in and out. So I think McManus should feel good about his performance. Winnipeg will return home to take on the Ottawa Rough Riders a week from tomorrow night, while the Toronto Argonauts go out to Vancouver to take on the BC Lions a week from tonight. Foggy goes down at the 12-yard line with 1.15 remaining. Well, they had the option play. They were trying to get the pitch to the pinball, and uh, it's strange to see Toronto with two tight ends and an eye-back offense. The Argos opened the season with a win over the Ottawa Rough Riders. They followed up with a victory last week over the Hamilton Ticats and are going to make it three in a row tonight. Leading Winnipeg 30 to 16. Toronto beat Ottawa 35-18, and they defeated Hamilton 41-18. Daryl Smith was the intended receiver with 48 seconds remaining. So again, the Argos are forced to kick it away. Well, Ricky really isn't looking to run tonight. It looks like uh, that was a designed quarterback sweep, just like the one uh, down by the goal line that uh, he made such a crucial play on. But he wasn't looking to run. He looked to throw the football, and now they're giving Winnipeg a chance to get back. And uh, with 48 seconds, uh, Winnipeg has a chance to get some points on the board. He's trying to explain to the coach, well, I had two blockers in front of me, but the receiver was open. Adam Reed is a running coach. He said that was a dirty word. They've been running lately. Lance Chomick got the kick away as Stan Mikolas was coming straight up the middle. This five yards. Ball picked up by Troy Johnson and taken out of bounds at the 37-yard line. Stan Mikowicz came straight up the middle and made a big effort of trying to block that Lance Chomick punt. A 29-yard kick. A week tonight will be at BC Place as the BC Lions take on the Toronto Argonauts. And you'll see it on CBC television beginning at 10.30 Eastern Time. They haven't announced the crowd tonight at the Sky Dome, but it appears to be very close to 40,000. Well, the noise level was certainly there. Well, we've just been informed, 37,846 the attendance. Eric Streeter, the intended receiver, it was knocked away from him, and then he was knocked down by Chris Gaines. It is a good crowd at the Sky Dome tonight certainly in excess of what they were drawing a year ago. And the uh, young people in the stands, I think, is interesting. Uh, you get a lot of youngsters in here that are enjoying football. They become fans for a long time. And the spectators tonight have had fun here at the Sky Dome, enjoying it even more with the Argos leading by that big margin. Larry Willis being covered by Ed Berry. 26 seconds of the time remaining. Ed Berry did a good job of looking for the football because he certainly made a collision and he uh, certainly impeded Larry Willis's progress. But if he's looking for the football, the official can't call interference because they're both allowed to have the ball. Well, Ed Berry won the battle in trying to get position for that football while it was in the air. And the Bombers go again on third down. This time, third and ten. Over the middle to Warren Hudson. Stopped short of the first down. So, with just 19 seconds remaining, that will officially do it. I think the Toronto Argos won this game more defensively 
than they did offensively. They seemed to change their personality on offense. They went to the two tight ends, a bimbo formation. They seemed to be more concerned about their protection. And uh, the defense came up with big plays time and time again. So I think you'd have to credit the Toronto defense. Instead of saying six pack, maybe the old 12 pack was <laughs> the 12 pack defensive players are the ones that did this for them. Adam Reed is not quite as happy as we've seen him in the last two weeks. Possibly thinking about the next few times he has to play Winnipeg and whether or not those two tight ends are what he designed them for. But he's got uh, 10 weeks before he has to worry about facing the Winnipeg Blue Bombers again. He doesn't meet the defending Grey Cup champions until late in the schedule, October 5th. The next time these two teams clash here at the Sky Dome, and then they play in Winnipeg on October 11th. And of course, the Grey Cup game takes place this year on November 24th in Winnipeg, and the Argos would love to make a second trip to Winnipeg late in the season. Or have Winnipeg make a trip for the semifinals, for the final in Toronto, and then go to Winnipeg. to put uh, some time back on the score clock. Darrell K. Smith is trying to run a touchdown. He to run after the play had been uh, whistled dead. It is now showing nine seconds remaining until the end of the ball game. The Argos off to a good start in this 1991 season. Not only are they doing well in the field, they are doing well at the box office. Almost 42,000 for their first home game and over 37,000 for this game tonight. As Joe said, a young crowd taking in the action. They've been having fun at the Sky Dome. They've been enjoying this one. And this wherever you're looking in on the CBC Television Network, we hope you've enjoyed it as well and will be with us again next Thursday night when we travel to Vancouver as the BC Lions entertain the Argos. This, well, is, this is almost like a designer football, isn't it? Well, in that play, the clock did not move at all. Adam Rita is looking up at the clock, but now... Now it's moving. It is moving, and that will uh, take it down to zero and signal the end this one and another victory for rookie head coach Adam Rita as his Argos defeat the Winnipeg Blue Bombers 30 to 16. They have a perfect record, three wins and no losses. Daryl Rogers and his Winnipeg Blue Bombers head home to face the Ottawa Rough Riders next Friday night with a record of one and two. The final score, Toronto 30, Winnipeg 16.